that I'm going to be go giving now. Don't you worry, it's only 10 minutes, and I promise I can answer any question very fast. So, for, for the sake of timing. So, just to, just to give you a little bit of an insight of the topic, we're going to be talking about liquidity in a tokenized world. So, for that matter, I just want to make something very clear that uh, I'm not going to enter into discussion of should we use a decentralized or not decentralized system. At the end of the day, everything that I'm going to focus on is going to be simply what is a capital infrastructure uh, that is needed in order to transact digital assets. So it'd be a centralized capital infrastructure, decentralized capital infrastructure, mixed infrastructure, whatever it is. So that I can focus really on the topic at hand, which is going to be the liquidity on the, on the assets. Okay? So just to give you a small introduction about myself, my name is Juan David. I'm the CEO of a company called Kirok. We are a liquidity uh, technology company that develops all kind of uh, algorithms and systems to, to manage liquidity across multiple uh, digital asset exchanges. My background has been on, on, um, on algorithmic trading. I work and everything that I do is under the principle that financial uh, infrastructure and financial systems are at the end of the day the most impactful thing in, in people's lives. And of course, I believe in the tokenization of the world, and that's why I decided to, to enter into this topic, which is how do we make uh, liquidity scale in a tokenized world where we want all of us to have hundreds of thousands of assets that are, that are tokenized. So in that regard, something that is very interesting, I mean, when I look at what is, a, what is an asset and how does it transact, why do people buy and sell an asset, it's very interesting when, when you look back and you don't think exclusively about assets as of what happened with the ICO bubble or what happened with any, any type of asset in the last two years. If you actually look at it in a more macro perspective, you realize that it's been a trend that regardless of the technology, it's been happening already for a very long time. Since the creation of automated trading by, by NASDAQ in the 70s, we have more and more type of assets that get tokenized in the sense that can be digitally traded. Of course, at the beginning, this starts with stocks. We start to have bonds. We start to have uh, ETFs, carbon bonds, uh, forex markets that start to get digitalized and people can trade them. And the, the continuation of this trend, of course, comes into to the ICO. So we have uh, the utility tokens. And what we're all expecting is that a lot more type of assets get that liquidity grade where they can be traded in a, in a digital platform. What is interesting about this is to think why is this happening? And it's not about blockchain or, or blockchain. It's just the simple effect that people want their assets to be easy to transact in the sense of not costly and very fast. You want to get rid of your assets or acquire assets very fast, very cheap. That's what everyone wants no matter what the asset is. And the technology that we use today enable us to do that with more type of assets, which is the reason why we all believe that the tokenization of the world is the next step for, for us. So ultimately what that means is that if you think about the value proposition of majority of the projects that are out there in, in, uh, in the tokenized world, both security tokens, uh, utility tokens, whatever it is, at the end of the day, if, if you are building a, a issuance platform, an exchange platform, an investor, you are a, a, a factory that makes assets and you, you, you have an incubator, whatever it is, at the end of the day, the value proposition of everything, it's liquidity. Why to do it this way instead of another way? Because the asset acquires liquidity. And that's actually very interesting because you can liquidate the assets. And that's why I dedicated uh, the last years of my life to trying to understand that, that is very specific problem because I found it at the core of what everyone in the industry was looking for. So on the matter of, of why liquidity and the value proposition of liquidity, we, we look at it on how, what, what's happening today. And of course, everyone wants the assets to be quick to transact. But on the other hand, what we see is that due to the inefficiency of the market, there is a mismatch between, between uh, the reality of the assets and what people want. People want them to be liquid, but the reality is that we only have few assets at the top, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or XRP, which acquire that liquidity grade. And, and even those tend to have majority of its transactions on the, on the OTC market. Um, so what, what has the industry been doing to, to solve that? And of course, it's a problem that a lot of people are trying, trying to fix. Uh, 
traditionally, both in the traditional financial industry as well as different approaches that people have taken into, into the digital asset industry, we have uh, digital systems that have been used to try to solve the problem. Like uh, you, you've heard, of course, of what is uh, market making and the concept of building a market. The problem with majority of these, of these uh, technologies and the systems today is that there is just not transparency and they are cum cumbersome to use. Generally, it is a luxury service where a company sells a tailor-made solution for a very specific problem and it requires a lot of human interaction. And that problem of scalability makes it to be something that cannot be easily rolled out in a tokenized world where we're going to see many, many assets getting tokenized. So you have a, we have a contradiction between how we're trying to solve liquidity and what we want as an industry in, in the future. And, and of course, that's a problem because uh, we can just continue the way that we're going where we have a lot of small uh, groups of people trying to tackle every specific uh, uh, problem uh, time at a time where even different companies in the industry have gone on building their own in-house teams to solve liquidity problems. That's generally been the, the trend in the, in the industry. And what that tells us is that basically no matter what system it is, if it's not a standardized, it's standardized, and if it's, um, if it's done by, by a large company, a small company, at the end of the day, solving liquidity is nothing else than having a well-thought mathematical model that can manage risk and present prices. And that's what it is. No matter if it's done through a, a reserve system like Bancor, no matter if it's done through a system that gets rid of order books in exchanges, or no matter if it's done through algorithmic trading, at the end of the day, it's just simply that. It's just how do we build mathematical models that we can deploy in such a way that they make a market useful for the investors that are engaging in that market. When I, when I personally started to understand this and understanding that it's all about that, of course, the next question is, Okay, but is it, is it something simple or what is the complexity behind, behind this? So what I started to realize, of course, is that all markets are not made equal. And on top of that, they, they evolve through time. And that's where is the complexity of this and the reasoning why in both the traditional industry and our industry today, this works in a very unstandardized way. Because a, no market is similar to another market, but on top of that, it evolves through time. And there is not even technology standards. Each, each, basically, each exchange or each venue where you could trade digital assets today have a completely different way of looking at their API, a different technology infrastructure, different way of, of processing the data, different functions, different everything. Then the market as a, like a like financial psychology is very different time to time, and it evolves through time very differently. So how do we really cope with those problems? And, and today, I'm, I'm not here to to basically give you a, a solution to the problem. My intention was more to come here, explain a little bit of why I believe this is a problem that we should be thinking about, and making a very small call to action if any one of you want to talk about it or have, have very interesting ideas to go over it. So when it, comes, when it comes down to it, the way that I look at it and the way that we look at it in our company, it is simply put into three characteristics. So we need to build a model that has a, capa a capacity for transparency, where everyone in the industry understands and is being educated on how do you solve this problem and what are the steps that you should take. There is self-adaptability, where we need to start looking at mathematical models that are not fixed into something, but that the other way around are fed by data and react to data towards the understanding of how to model a world, how to model a market. And of course, there needs to be process standardization. There needs to be a way in which any liquidity system can be deployed in a matter of seconds. These are the problems that we work at at, at Kirok. We try to solve uh, all the three, three aspects of the puzzle. Uh, for doing that, we, we're doing many different tests and prototypes where, with many different types of algorithms from uh, liquidity systems, market making systems, RFQ systems, optimal liquidation systems, whatever it is. But at the end, it doesn't really matter what a system does or if it's the need of a broker, an exchange, a founder of an ICO token that wants liquidity. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the same. How do we make systems that are self-adaptable? They provide that are transparent and everyone understands how they work and what they provide and that they're standardized so they can very quickly deploy through markets. So that's what we work on. If you guys would like to talk about it, you can contact me directly. We are Kirok and we work to solve the problem of liquidity because we strive for democratizing liquidity in the digital asset world. Thank you very much.
Oh, thanks. Very useful. Yeah. Hi. So um, just just your your vision. Is it better to have a order book? Uh, or something like Uniswap or DutchX is uh, proposing like some auction me yeah. mechanisms sure. for a price discovery and for yeah. trading in the future. Yeah. Do you see that we have, uh, let's say in the next five, ten years, will we still look at the order books or we will just, uh, you know, avoid them and have just yeah. one transparent system for price discovery mechanism? Yeah. Thank you. So. Um, I think, I mean, it's a very interesting question, uh, a little bit what I was saying at the beginning that I, I truly believe that no matter the, the system that we use, the problem is, is, doesn't go away because we stop using order books. As a matter of fact, during the last year, I've been in, a, in very close contact with the Gnosis team talking about the, the project. And if you can, you can uh, check it with them, huh? but, but basically they, they managed to build this whole mechanism to try to avoid the use of order books, but at the end of the day, their biggest problem is still the liquidity. So an algorithm that interacts into an auction system like the one of the Dutch exchange might not work ex at all like a market-making algorithm, but still follows into the same criteria. Basically, how do you build liquidity, availability of prices according to a mathematical model, and how do you do that for thousands of assets very fast? So it's gonna be exactly the same. At the end of the day, it's all about infrastructure, it's all about deployment. And if it comes down to using or not using order books, of course, I'm a finance guy, and, and I always believe that humans are, are an animal of habit, and we're already used to it. So it's going to be very hard, very, very hard to convince people to stop using the order book, because it's already very ingrained on, on how transaction occurs. Of course, systems like that have their space, and they might take time until they have adoption. But in, in the meantime, I, I do believe that order books are something that are not going to go away soon uh, at all. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.